Welcome to History of Health Information Technology in the U.S., the High Tech Act. This is Lecture B, Meaningful Use, Health Information Exchange and Research. The objectives for this unit, the High Tech Act, are to discuss the barriers to adoption of health IT that the High Tech Act is designed to address. Discuss how the following ARA High Tech requirements relate to previous developments in health IT. Certified electronic health records, Concept of meaningful use, including e-prescribing, clinical decision support, interoperability, and HIE. Structured documentation of quality measures. Incentives to providers. Education of clinicians. Workforce development. Give examples of how high-tech provisions support healthcare reform efforts. Discuss the overall vision for the effects of the High-Tech Act. Although the High Tech Act provided funding for health IT workforce development, if you remember, an inadequate workforce was only one factor leading to low adoption. There were also concerns about the cost of EHRs. To address some of the financial burdens, High Tech provisions included financial incentives from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also known as CMS, for adopting EHRs. Please refer to the slide and the circled third item from the top in the left-hand column. CMS is a major payer for health care for people over 65, for the poor, and for the handicapped. Most health care providers have patients who are covered under Medicare, so incentives for Medicare would have a widespread impact. As we said, financial incentives are needed to motivate health care providers to spend the money and time to invest in EHRs and learn how to use them. Although EHRs offer the possibilities of cost savings from such things as preventing costly errors and avoiding duplicate tests and other cost savings, there is clearly an upfront cost and many of these savings may not be automatically realized. The approach taken by CMS was to provide higher incentives for early adoption. That is, more incentives were offered for those beginning to use an EHR in 2011, with decreasing incentives over time until 2015. After that, the intent was to penalize non-users of EHRs. The expression carrot and stick, for those of you unfamiliar with it, is used when you use a combination of rewards and punishments to get someone to do something. In this case, the carrot is the adoption incentive and the stick is the threat of penalties for not adopting. But remember that one of the barriers was not just adopting EHRs, but using them in a way that can lead to improved quality of care. To assure that the incentives would be tied to using the EHRs for improved quality, the incentives were tied to the concept of meaningful use of EHRs. What this means is that physicians who use EHRs in a meaningful way would be paid more by CMS for their services. The focus for the requirement for meaningful use of the EHR was to implement features of the EHR that were designed to improve the outcomes of care. There were also escalating expectations for actually getting the incentives. What this meant is that it is easier to qualify for incentives early on, and the bar continued to be raised over time as to what qualifies for meaningful use incentives. Other agencies involved with defining and monitoring meaningful use included the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology and the groups that certify electronic health records. And while the idea of meaningful use can have many meanings, CMS is defining it to mean some very specific things. To arrive at the final decision, CMS proposed a rule with specific recommendations as to what constitutes meaningful use and asked for comments from the healthcare community in January 2010. The final criteria for 2011 and 2012 were released in July 2010 after a review of comments. These are the Stage 1 criteria. The July rules included most of the same elements as the January rule, but they took into account the comments that said the expectations were too difficult to meet for most healthcare providers. The same process was done to arrive at the final Stage 2 rules that were released in September 2012, but were finalized in 2014. For instance, in the Stage 1 proposed rule, 
It was expected that five clinical decision support rules would be implemented, but in the final recommendation, clinical decision support was still expected, but only one rule was required. The Stage 2 final rules do actually require five clinical decision support rules, and some criteria that were optional in Stage 1 are now required in Stage 2. These rules led to a rapid increase in adoption of EHRs. Stage 3 rules changed the focus from use of specific EHR features to a greater focus on the quality outcomes and on interoperability and health information exchange. The Stage 3 criteria were incorporated into a new incentive program, known as the Medicare Incentive Payment System, or MIPS. This new program, slated to take effect in 2019, aligns a variety of incentive programs focusing on health care quality. It is expected that the criteria may also change over time as experience with them occurs. It is likely that if the rules seem too difficult to implement, the expectations may not increase as quickly over the years as initially expected. The current meaningful use criteria include the following elements as listed on the screen. Computerized Provider Order Entry, or CPOE. Clinical Decision Support, often abbreviated as CDS. Electronic Prescribing, also known as e-prescribing. Structured Documentation of Quality Measures. Up-to-date Problem Lists and Diagnoses. Provide Patients with Health Information Electronically. Information Exchange. And finally, reporting clinical quality measures to CMS. While the final details of how these elements become part of the criteria for meaningful use will change over time, either escalating as intended or being modified if there are problems, it is very likely that these elements will be part of the definition in one form or another because they are key to improving quality. So let's explore what they are in detail. Computer-based provider order entry is sometimes referred to as computerized or computer-based physician order entry because most of the time it is the physician who decides on orders for medications, laboratory tests, referrals, etc. But the abbreviation CPOE is used for any of these meanings. Although CPOE takes longer than scribbling an order on a piece of paper, it can speed the overall process of ordering. In addition, it can increase the legibility of the orders, preventing callbacks from pharmacists and others who might need help deciphering the physician's handwriting. Increasing the legibility will improve quality by reducing errors due to hard-to-read handwriting, but clinical decision support is needed to really improve the quality of care. Clinical decision support systems are systems or tools designed to provide support for the clinician making the decision. In some cases, the physician can seek out the support, and in other cases, it is provided automatically. Examples of the former include references on treating a given disease that the physician can seek. An example of automatically providing decision support would be to display alerts to physicians about possible drug interactions when they are ordering medications. Order sets can also be considered decision support. Order sets might be, for example, a list of all the recommended tests that should be done each visit on a patient with diabetes. Clinical decision support tools can be helpful at all stages of care, including the diagnostic stage, treatment and follow-up, and as reminders for preventing disease. E-prescribing is specifically for medication ordering and is often referred to in the context of outpatient as opposed to hospital medication orders. At a minimum, e-prescribing has traditionally referred to electronic order entry for medications, but also includes transmission to the pharmacy. A complete e-prescribing system would also include clinical decision support, such as guidelines on appropriate choice of drugs, alerts for drug interactions, and formularies. That is, preferred drugs for a given patient's insurance coverage and transmission to the patient's preferred pharmacy. Structured documentation is currently one of the real challenges because even in places where electronic records are used, many physicians still dictate their notes. Even when these notes are stored electronically, which of course is helpful, it is difficult to extract data from them. 
Meaning using electronic health records means that not only can you store the data so it is viewable, but you can get the data out so you can study it and analyze it for ways to improve care. And to do that, the data need to be entered in a more structured way than simple dictation can do. In particular, the requirements for meaningful use are that data on patients' laboratory tests be captured in structured form, and that data for certain quality measures can be extracted. Providers are required to capture data on blood pressure, smoking, and obesity, and report these to CMS. They also have some choice in other quality measures. To do this, data have to be entered in a more structured form than currently used. The challenges of capturing or extracting data to get consistent measures of quality across different providers are many. Different electronic systems often capture and store data in different ways. As we said, much data today is currently in unstructured text files that do not lend themselves to easy analysis. Even the definitions of many of the terms are not standard, and as we said earlier, even if the data are captured well in a single physician's EHR, there are often different technical standards used among providers, hospitals, and laboratories. Probably one of the biggest barriers is that capturing structured data takes more time than scribbling a few notes, which is another reason the incentives for meaningful use are needed. The electronic health records need to contain up-to-date problem lists and diagnoses, and health care providers have to have a way of providing patients with their own health information electronically. One way to do this is to set up a personal health record, or PHR, for each patient. The most recent meaningful use rule requires that not only must health care providers give patients online access, but they must have a certain percentage of patients use it for downloading or transferring the information. Like many of the other rules, the percentage of patients who must use it will likely increase with later stages. Another requirement is for information exchange, which will be limited at first, but gradually escalates as more and more providers adopt EHRs. The Stage 1 requirement was just to demonstrate the capability for health information exchange. In 2014, that requirement was eliminated, but instead providers have to actually engage in health information exchange. The MIPS program incorporates even more extensive requirements for exchange of information. One type of exchange that is required in Stage 2 is to submit data to registries. Stage 2 requires data sent to immunization registries and for hospitals to exchange data for public health reporting. While other types of registry submissions may be optional initially, they may become required in the future, as will other types of health information exchange. Another type of information exchange is to provide summary data on the visit in electronic form not only to the patient, but to other providers during transitions of care, such as doctors to whom a physician refers, or back to the primary care physician when the patient leaves the hospital. In addition, providers must report clinical quality measures in electronic form to CMS. Both Stage 1 and Stage 2 had what were called core and menu objectives, these core objectives were required for both hospitals and eligible providers. The hospital and eligible provider objectives were similar with only a few differences. In addition, there was a set of what is a menu of activities or objectives where providers had some choice in what they selected to adopt. As an example, in Stage 1, there were 15 core objectives for eligible providers, 14 of which also applied to hospitals. There were 10 menu objectives, and healthcare providers can choose which five they choose to implement. Similarly, while certain core quality measures were required, there were others where there was a choice. For Stage 2, there were more core requirements and fewer menu items, and many of the previous menu items from Stage 1 became core requirements. This was another way that the final rule kept to the original aims, but tried to be responsive to the need for greater flexibility. It also illustrates how the bar with each subsequent stage continued to rise. Some requirements that were once optional became required. There were more core requirements and fewer menu options, and the percentage of patients for whom the rule applies continued to increase. One of the major changes planned for MIPS program is to actually have fewer objectives and to have somewhat more flexibility in meeting them. 
In addition to providing incentives to individual hospitals and physician practices to promote the meaningful use of health IT, high tech also provided funding for what were called beacon communities. These are communities that already had demonstrated strong health IT capabilities. The funding was to strengthen them so that they could become models in using information exchange to promote meaningful use to improve quality and reduce costs. The name Beacon Communities comes from the idea of a beacon or lantern that lights the path for others to follow. We said earlier that the barriers to smooth information exchange among health care providers are still a problem. Health information exchange by itself is an example of meaningful use, which is why it is one of the requirements for the meaningful use incentives. But health information exchange is also a means to promote even more meaningful use of health IT. For these reasons, the High Tech Act also includes some specific methods to promote health information exchange. Sharing information requires that information systems be able to talk with each other and be understood. This is called interoperability. To be able to talk to each other requires common technical standards so that a message sent can be received. To be understood also means that not only must there be common technical standards, but the vocabulary must be common as well. There are still many standards where there is lack of agreement, which has inhibited information exchange up to now. The High Tech Act included funding for activities to promote information exchange. In addition to the Beacon Communities funding, there was funding for demonstration projects for identifying models for interoperability and information exchange. As well, there have been grants provided to states to set up statewide information exchange processes. There were also efforts at what has been called standards harmonization that included reconciling the different technical and vocabulary standards. This process began with the Health Information Technology Standards Panel and is being continued under HITECH with the formation of the HIT Standards Committee. Other issues we mentioned were the privacy and security issues. Under HITECH, the existing rules for privacy and security were strengthened, and the meaningful use requirements also addressed these issues. Finally, as these changes are implemented, they will become part of the requirements for a certification process for EHRs since the rules for meaningful use require practitioners to use certified EHR technology. The requirement that payment for meaningful use requires certified electronic health records is important for two reasons. First of all, it is a sort of seal of approval that can help assure purchasers that the systems that they are getting have had some review. The second reason is that the certification requirements are set up to include functions that meet the requirements for meaningful use and facilitate health information exchange. When the Stage 1 Meaningful Use rules came out, there was a temporary certification program where six organizations were authorized to test and certify EHRs so that people could begin to qualify for the meaningful use incentives as early as 2011. ONC has now established a permanent certification program where the testing of the vendor products is done by the testing labs and the certification itself is done by the certification bodies. Some of the same testing and certifying organizations involved in the temporary program have continued into the permanent program and new ones have been added. In the spring of 2016, the Office of the National Coordinator proposed a new rule that gives them more direct responsibility in regard to the certification process. The rule requires ONC to directly review the certified health information technology and to take any needed actions to address problems. It also provides for ONC to more directly oversee the actual testing labs that test the products, and it requires more transparency, including public reporting, of the surveillance activities of the certifying bodies. One of the other barriers we mentioned previously was that the technology itself needs improvement in many areas. To address this barrier, in addition to the workforce training for new engineers and scientists, the High Tech Act provided funds for major collaborative research projects known as the SHARP grants. SHARP stands for Strategic Health IT Advanced Research Projects. 
Because the vision of high-tech includes moving toward nationwide health information exchange, there are still many areas where current systems need technological development and or improvement for that scale of information exchange. Four awards were made to focus on several key areas that need work in order to realize the high-tech vision. The first area, security of health information technology, involved research to develop security processes in anticipation of large-scale health information exchange. Similarly, the second area, healthcare application and network platform architectures, aimed at developing new applications and new ways they can be integrated into EHRs. In 2009, an influential report by William Stead and Herbert Lin found that most current EHR systems, even those at very advanced institutions, were inadequate in providing easy-to-use support to enhance the thinking and decision-making of doctors. In addition to the issues connected with information exchange, the SHARP Awards also funded research on how best to provide this type of cognitive support. The word cognitive means involving thinking and decision-making. Some of the research involved usability testing and developing ways to design the screens and processes to make the systems better match the way users think and work. Finally, since the ultimate aim of high-tech was to use health IT to promote improved quality, the fourth award was for developing methods to effectively use the vast store of clinical data in EHRs for quality improvement and research. You may remember that the final barrier was that, prior to high tech, we did not have sustained health IT leadership at a national level. A new president could undo an executive order under which the National Coordinator for Health IT was appointed. That barrier was addressed when, as a result of high-tech, the position of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology became protected by law. In addition, two committees were established to provide guidance on the key issues of health information technology policy and standards. This concludes Lecture B of the High-Tech Act. In summary, under the leadership of the National Coordinator, the implementation of high-tech was designed to address many of the barriers to use of electronic health records. Since the High-Tech Act passed, the adoption of electronic health records has dramatically increased. Providers had the financial and human assistance they need to meaningfully use certified electronic health records to improve the quality of patients' health outcomes. To facilitate those improvements, there will need to be widespread, interoperable information exchange through a nationwide health information network. Although there have been bumps along the way, as a result of the High-Tech Act, we are now on the road to realizing that vision.